In the future, we will travel to strange new worlds, but who will pilot the spaceships that take us there? Possibly one of the most dreamed of jobs in modern times and in science fiction is to be an astronaut and to crew a spaceship, and today we'll be looking at various selection criteria and discussing them. I should emphasize we won't be trying to say what is best or right today, as it's likely to be highly dependent on both your technology and cultural or physiological aspects that we cannot anticipate well right now. We know what the big ones are for nowadays, every astronaut is expected to have a degree in something relevant, typically STEM fields, and a lot of professional experience in that field. Extensive background as a pilot is appreciated, especially on experimental vehicles as a test pilot, but that's likely to drop away as a major consideration. Nowadays, every spaceship flight, even a reusable spacecraft that's flown before, is essentially an experimental one, and your crew is rarely more than a handful of people. Down the road a crew of dozens or hundreds or even hundreds of thousands is not going to require piloting skill as a major criteria for astronauts in general any more than a chef's background would matter for roles beyond ship's cook. When you only have a crew of three or four, or maybe a bit more, everyone has to wear a bunch of different hats, and so one thing you're looking for is a knack for quickly picking up some skills. But the reality is if you're picking smart folks who are decently diligent and you have tons of resources, you can bring in a good instructor and see which astronaut might be interested in obtaining that skill who also isn't completely overloaded with other hats yet. That goes away after a while too, when your ship's commander, doctor, and pilot don't all have to check 50 other job boxes between them, and many of those boxes need to be checked twice for redundancy, a primary, and their backup or relief. In the short term, if you're looking to be an astronaut, get a degree in STEM, hit the gym daily, get your pilot's license, and max out your basic life skills catalog like it was merit badges in the Scouts. Also join the Scouts, 20 of the men who flew to the moon, landing or not, were Boy Scouts, and as of 2022, 41 of those selected as NASA career astronauts were Eagle Scouts. I cited that statistic to my wife when making the case that my sons and daughter should join the Cub Scouts. I remember looking over the expanded merit badge list they have nowadays since I was a kid and at first thinking it was spilling out a bit beyond scout skills to more general life skills, and I could make a case for and against a lot of that expansion, but it definitely does apply to space. Space is big, a lot bigger than Earth, and down here we need all those life skills and more and there's more of space so we need all of those in space. Eventually, down the road, if it happens here, unless AI or other technology might eliminate it, we will need it up there too. That's a bit broad for our purposes today though, so I thought we might narrow in on some classic examples, and one of those is the notion that crew should be all one gender, typically male though the reverse has been suggested too, and the main reason given being that on average women use less food and oxygen than men do so that you could generally send four gals for every three guys on the same supplies. One of the flip side arguments on that or using people of low weight is muscle requirements. A spacesuit is a lot of weight, low gravity or not, those typically mass as much as a person and retain that inertial mass. For my part I do not expect food, water, air, or spaceship mass to be real limiting factors on space travel, and the same reasoning that applies to suggestions like picking a crew who were all the same height and chest and inseam so they need less redundant gear, same spacesuit for each of them, and you only need one backup, not one for each crew member. Almost from the outset though, space has been desired to be inclusive, famously for all mankind, so while you can make cases for this or that parameter that might genuinely work better by excluding or standardizing, the working principle has been to seek to work around that, not toward that. Ultimately there is also the practical long term need that pushes for mixed gendered crews and that is that unless you're planning to colonize space with clones, you need to be putting families or potential families on board those ships. This is less the case for short term exploration missions. But Robert Heinlein tackles the idea in his 1961 novel Stranger in a Strange Land, 
and for the story it proposes that the first mission to Mars with an eight-man crew should instead be four men and four women, and concludes they should all be married, to one other member of the crew, though the novel definitely explores non-traditional relationships. I don't think Heinlein is proposing this as the best option considering the fate of the crew, but the idea generally goes that married men are more stable anyway, and that two years on a cramped spaceship is going to be rough on folks if they're married and left their partner behind, especially if they're all people on board they're potentially attracted to. In that book's case, the space agency that sends the first Mars mission on board the ship Envoy is selecting crew and Michael Brandt wants to be selected gets the inside scoop from a friend that it is going to be married couples who get preferences, and gets the name of the single female astronaut topping the candidate list, Dr. Winifred Coburn, 46, and catches the first flight out to see her and propose marriage on the spot, to which she agrees, and they both land a slot with him serving as commander, pilot, astrogator, relief cook, relief photographer, rocketry engineer, and she gets the role of semantician, practical nurse, stores officer, and historian. The other six in order were Mr. Francis X. Cini, 28, executive officer, second pilot, astrogator, astrophysicist, photographer. Dr. Olga Kavalik Cini, 29, cook, biochemist, hydroponicist. Dr. Ward Smith, 45, physician and surgeon, biologist. Dr. Mary Jane Lyle Smith, 26, Atomics Engineer, Electronics and Power Technician. Mr. Sergei Rimsky, 35, Electronics Engineer, Chemical Engineer, Practical Machinist and Instrumentation Man, Cryologist. Mrs. Eleonora Alvarez Rimsky, 32, Geologist and Selenologist, Hydroponicist. We can certainly debate how important each of those roles are and if any are missing, Heinlein wrote the book almost a decade before the moon landings and the context of a long duration mission, not a three day stay. How practical four married couples on a spaceship would be is hard to say, but he shows the design flaw that finishes up the prologue to start the book, insofar as at least two of the astronauts were not truly a couple and we see at least one other couple was either similarly assembled or on the rocks. One of the crew, Dr. Mary Jane Lyle Smith, gets pregnant on the voyage and everyone seems to know it is not her husband's child but Captain Brandt's, not much privacy on a spaceship. Very few reports come from the Envoy after landing, but Dr. Ward Smith attempted to deliver the child, but had to perform a cesarean and she died on the table from complications. Dr. Smith then used the same scalpel he operated on her with to cut Captain Brandt's throat and then his own. In the story, World War III breaks out not long after that so it's quite a while before a second mission can be sent to investigate, that on board the Champion, which is explicitly an all-male crew with the prior incident in mind, and they find to no surprise that the Envoy left no survivors. Then they find out to their surprise there actually was one survivor, that baby, and that Mars was thoroughly inhabited already. Needless to say, it is a fictional situation, not experimental evidence, but it raises a lot of the crew selection considerations. One of those that does come up is if the crew should be on birth control while on a Mars mission or some other long journey where resupply and help is hard to offer. Families on ships is a tricky and touchy subject at a lot of levels. For those who remember Star Trek The Next Generation, one of the big differences from the original series is that the Starship Enterprise has not just married couples, which we do see in the original series, including a wedding performed by Captain Kirk, but also families on board the Next Generation ship. Children on board a Federation Starship is something that initially really irritates Captain Picard, and it's not hard to see why. Early on there is a constant insistence that Starfleet is not a military, in spite of having all the trappings and rules of one plus ships and guns, and that its mission is exploration. If the Enterprise is anything to go by, any single season of its voyages makes it clear to me that having civilian bystanders on board, let alone children, is beyond criminally negligent. They seem to have caught on to that by the time Voyager came out and Deep Space Nine, as a frontier outpost with families on board, made more sense having kids. The type of mission and its duration seem important in that sort of decision of course, and one could see how for any short term mission it wouldn't matter as much, while for a longer term mission it is a bit of a big deal, 
and an even longer tour mission it's an even bigger deal as you might need kids to replace your crew. One can make the case that any mission that requires future crew members be children not yet born is on somewhat shaky ethical grounds, especially on a smaller ship where there might be just a few dozen crew and a child born to that group has fewer life options than a medieval village, including the ability to run away. And while crew might have very impressive qualifications themselves and likely pass a lot of those on to their kids, you do need to keep in mind that if your crew is barely up to the task and composed of the best of the best, Generation 2 might really struggle, and simply adding a teacher and relief teacher to the crew slots is no guarantee that all those kids are going to have the right stuff. The right stuff and the cream of the crop is, of course, our guiding policy these days, even if what that right stuff is can be very debatable, but those standards should loosen as we need more people in space and get more experience with space. How do we experiment with this? Common sense is key, but this is science so we do like to test our hypotheses. The main method is with analog astronauts, a very underappreciated group of folks, and the criteria for them is pretty stringent too. Analog missions aim to be as analogous to the real one as practical, obviously we cannot simulate zero gravity on Earth, but we can simulate a 10 minute signal lag for conversations with home, or having an expert back home try to help with a theoretical problem, like explaining how to repair something. So if we wanted to model and test the crew the Envoy used, for married couples, we could sequester four volunteer analog astronaut couples in a set of living quarters of similar dimensions to the possible ship, and with those limited supplies and that signal lag and see what happens. And of course to do it right we need several such groups, and could then test how well that worked, what problems tended to emerge, and ditto for all male or female crews, and for various other parameters we might imagine, even potentially minor things like dietary or hygiene considerations. One of the more recent analog missions was Chappia, Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog, and that got underway this summer and will run for a year at Johnson Space Center. If we're looking for basic positions, it's got a commander, Kelly Haston, flight engineer Ross Brockwell, medical officer Nathan Jones, science officer Anka Salerio, and where those names might not be obvious to listeners or I'm gobbling the pronunciation, that's two guys and gals each, and they are getting crammed into a 1700 square foot, Mars style habitat together for a year. So what makes for a good crew member? What is a good analog? We do have a lot of ships that sail the oceans now for months at a time, and only in recent years did those get telephones and internet and bandwidth isn't impressive. Submarines and any ships before instant global communications can tell us a lot too, as can remote and hostile outposts like Antarctic ones. What is the ideal crew member, personality wise? Can and should we test for that? Would something like the Myers-Briggs or Big Five Aspects personality test be useful and if so, which categories would be best? The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator or MBTI is perhaps the best known personality test and you've likely taken it or some diluted online equivalent, it's around 100 questions long and is measuring you on a 4 axis chart. How extroverted or introverted you are, if you are more intuitive or detail and fact focused, a thinker or feeler, and if you're a judger or perceiver which measures if you're more organized or spontaneous. There are 16 categories and they are general and their utility is debatable. I've had the test a few times and decent facsimiles a few more and I generally got INTJ or ENTJ. I usually score right near the middle but tilted slightly to introversion, these days I tend to be more extroverted but I'm basically an ambivert. I like socializing in crowds I fit in with, but can spend whole days in my cave happily too. There's a lot of debate how useful it is, and these days I've generally heard higher trust in the Big Five Personality or Aspects test, which measures openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, and it gets called the Ocean Test occasionally as an acronym as well as CANOE and the categories are more detailed than their one word description. They can have different names too, the Pentagon model extroversion, vigorous, methodical, emotional stability, and abstract. The Hexaco model uses honesty, humility as an additional factor, and Jordan Peterson helped develop a version with five categories 
each split into two groups for 10 variables. Typically you get ranked on a scale of 10, last time I took one was 4 years ago when my wife and I were dating and I came out 9 on openness, 9 on conscientiousness, 6 on extroversion, 8 on agreeableness, and 4 on neuroticism. I'd imagine regular viewers find none of that surprising, this test doesn't usually produce shocking results for people we know. High scores are not necessarily positive things, incidentally, and they can shift with time. I'd gone up on extroversion just a hair and down on neuroticism since the prior time I'd taken it, and I would bet I would be a little less agreeable if I took it today, a byproduct of having three kids, though I doubt I would have moved on anything more than a point. Life experience, maturity, and effort can move the needle on these, but they are fairly stable for the individual. Most folks in the field I know view this one as having better predictive capacity and unsurprisingly some of those traits are good for screening nearly any job, especially space. Conscientiousness is always a nice trait in an employee or crew member. You do not want someone who is too high in neuroticism on your team if it's stressful and dangerous. On the flip side, you might not want someone too casually relaxed and upbeat, especially as a security chief, though a very negative and paranoid one isn't ideal either. There are advantages to having leaders or team members who are agreeable or disagreeable, and the big takeaway would be that there might be an optimal score for one individual position but not for a team or crew overall, nor for an individual position for every different combination of accompanying crew personalities. This does not necessarily mean on a crew of 16 you want one of each MBTI personality type or that you want an even mix of folks on the big five. You would not want the same mix for different mission types either, some remote base in the Oort Cloud whose only job is to watch for enemies and keep an eye on their doomsday devices in the basement might have a crew of 6 and require 4 of them to turn the proverbial launch key, so that no lone member can veto or do so by killing a peer and refusing, removing two keys rapidly with no reaction time. This is very different from the environment of some freighter or trade vessel or the crew of a space cruise ship. Critically, this is also a measure of personality, not anything else, it's not IQ or a measure of skills. But there might be occasions where a less skilled crew member with a better suited personality is handy. A very skilled and ambitious person might merely ruffle feathers on their brief stay before moving to the next job, and this is something that comes up in hiring in modern times too. A good resume sounds handy, but a lot of folks follow the strategy that the best employee is the one who comfortably meets the minimum needed skills but does not much exceed them, thus is not bored to death or leaving as soon as they find a better job. It's also something we discuss here a lot in terms of AI, Never make one smarter than the job requires without a human operating it. Your robot vacuum cleaner or lawnmower does not need much brains, and always ask if that job can be broken into multiple more simple ones even dumber AI could do with just a little help from a human. Autonomous AI mostly should not be needed, especially when humans like to have things to do anyway and we have a lot of them. Your ship's medic really does not need to be the most elite and skilled doctor around either, as is implied in Star Trek with McCoy, Crusher, Pulaski, or Bashir. You could argue the flagship of a federation devoted to exploration likes to put its best scientists on the front lines of course. Star Trek really takes liberties with crew positions, ranks, and terms like flagship, which usually implies an admiral is present on that ship, but they do show us fairly complete groups of main characters as the writers are trying to flush out a robust and interesting cast and ones without major flaws. Alternatively, a lot of shows like to show us more flawed characters on a crew, Firefly did that, so did Battlestar Galactica, and while I think it did often make for more interesting stories, I would argue it is not actually more realistic, drama is something you want in a show, not a spaceship crew. And even on the big adventures and dangerous prototypes, 99% of your time is spent in prep work and maintenance a steady but quick pitch of preparation, as the reason the unofficial motto of the US Army is hurry up and wait. This is even more extreme in space, right now every crewed mission is basically a prototype and a short one, except for modern stays on the International Space Station where the crews are up long enough for some normality to kick in, and where most of the equipment and station overall have transitioned into being known quantities. 
One's way our automation and simple AI have probably taken over a lot of it too. A space mission's shift to year-long voyages to other planets with tried and true technologies on the ship and making it up, your degree of boredom can rise a lot. It helps with stress, of course, and so you might see a shift away from folks who can live and breathe stress and excitement for days on end to folks who are trained for a crisis but used to and content to twiddle their thumbs on the job and play Minecraft or scroll through their social media. In my time in the Army, even when in the active war zone at the front lines, we spent most of our time on routine matters, and even thumb twiddling or catching up on our reading. The same is often true of police and other first responders, and an ability for protracted times of calm, patient readiness is just as vital as grace under fire when the brief moments of stress and chaos occur. And since phone calls in real time aren't an option much in space beyond Earth and the Moon, email and social media become a big ordeal. You're leaving text, audio, or video messages for people and seeing theirs. That does help a lot with loneliness and isolation. Old days, someone at a remote outpost or even solo only had their own head and maybe a few books they could read until the pages wore out. A good agreeableness score would be handy here if you only had a few people, and a high introversion score handy if you were it. But now we can fit a million books on a thumb drive, and a few redundant hard drives on a spaceship could contain backups of all needed data and an extensive library of educational material, entertainment videos, video games, interactive virtual realities, and more. And yet, in the future, the right stuff for a spaceship crew might become a willingness and desire to be on board, first and foremost, because those voyages will be long, and especially on something like an interstellar freighter or arc ship, where your passengers might be frozen if the trip was too long for them to want to endure, the most important trait of a crew member would just be able to be willing to be on that ship for years and able to remain sane and happy for that voyage, or at least stable and reasonably content. Imagine it's your job to be the pilot of a Gardner ship, stopping every century to offload passengers at a new world and take on raw materials, or a space freighter hauling iron and aluminum from the mines of Epsilon Iridani back to the nascent and material-hungry Dyson Swarm emerging back here. You've got a lot of spare time to be joggy up and down the mile-long corridors of the ship, or around its habitat ring, or writing that novel you always wanted to work on, or having a family, which is the basic idea behind generation ships and Gardner fleets anyway. And if ships have long journeys like that, Odds are you have kids on board who learn the family trade, or have folks get off at every stop looking for a change and openings for that wide-eyed young person waiting to see the stars. One of the neat things about the future is the criteria to be on a spaceship crew will keep widening. You won't need perfect vision, but even if you did, we'll have corrective surgery. You won't need to be as fit as an athlete, but if you did, we'll probably have procedures and protocols for that too. You may not need to be good at reading tech manuals because the future might have very good augmented reality instructions that will rapidly and intuitively walk you through the piece of equipment better than a manual, and the process of maintaining and fixing it when needed. You learn it easier and don't need to know it as much. As I like to say, the point of technology is to be able to have your cake and eat it too, or in this case, serve on board a spaceship crew. So today we were talking about selecting crew for spaceships, which had as much to do with interpersonal relationships as crew skill sets, and I found myself wondering how would you celebrate holidays on board them, what's a Christmas tree look like in zero gravity, and what does a holiday calendar look like on board a spaceship moving relativistically between planets with different calendars. Selecting gifts for others is likely to be just as tricky as now, but you can rarely go wrong with a gift meant to improve someone's day, and for a lot of us, that day includes listening to podcasts or audiobooks, and a nice set of Raycon Everyday Earbuds offers top-notch audio quality in a compact, wireless, and durable format. Raycons made a name for themselves by offering premium audio devices at a great price, and now offers other home technologies too like their faucet filter or Magic 180 charging cable, which has interchangeable magnetic tips to be compatible with your devices. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds have been my go-to for audio for years now, as they let me listen in crystal clear comfort and without worrying they'll fall out and get lost or run out of power. They are a must-have for any audio lover, 
They make great gifts, but why not treat yourself to some too? They are limited time bundle deals that you get a discount buying some for gifts and one for yourself. They offer easy and free returns, free shipping, and buy now, pay later options. This holiday season, get premium audio and power tech at a great price, and save even more doing it. Go to buyraycon.com slash IsaacArthur to get 15% off site-wide. So that will wrap us up for today, but we're just getting started for December, and we have a lot of episodes this month. This weekend, December 10th, we return to our Alien Civilization series for Sci-Fi Sunday and a look at Nihilistic Aliens. Next week we'll talk about ways to warp and manipulate reality on December 14th. In two weeks we'll look at discussing silicon-based life forms on December 21st, followed by a bonus episode for the holidays where we'll ask if we truly will colonize space. Then we'll finish the month and year with clearing space debris on the 28th and our final livestream Q&A on Sunday, December 31st. And if you missed it, don't forget to catch last weekend's bonus episode, Orbital Defense Platforms, along with December's Nebula exclusive, a look at the Fermi Paradox and the Hermit Shoplifter Hypothesis. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week.